My name is Shanamar Ogilvy, and I'm sharing this with you because my life has been completely changed. And today I'm going to show you my testimony. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I was before God Himself came into my life. Now, I was someone that believed in God. I was somebody that believed in His Son Jesus Christ. I was baptized. I never cursed. I never stole. I never did drugs. Now, I did lie, but I would only tell white lies. I committed sexual sin, but I asked God to forgive me. I did go to church, but I stopped going to church for a while. And I never read the Bible because it did not interest me. And if I did read, I'd probably read a verse at a time or something that I'd heard. And if you were to ask me at this point in my life, if I was a Christian, if I was going to go to heaven, and if I loved God, my answer would have been yes. Now, what I'm about to share with you is going to let you know that that was absolutely false. I was wrong. This all happened last year, April 23rd, 2012. I had a dream. I could not wake up from this dream. It was the most terrifying ridiculous dream, craziest dream that I'd ever had. And I wanted to get out of there. I'm like, I'm trying to hit myself. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. Nothing worked. In my deepest, darkest moment of hopelessness, the only thing that I can think of to do when I tried everything else before was to call out to God with all my heart, my mind, and my soul. And I said, God, Please, please, please get me out of here. I got to get out of this dream. I got to get out of this dream. Please, God, get me out of this dream. Now, in the middle of the dream, I heard a voice. The voice says, read your Bible. Boom. My eyes opened up. And I'm like, read my Bible? I don't even know what my Bible is. I haven't read that thing in like eight years. After I said those words, I heard another voice. Now, this is about five something in the morning. The voice says to me, the Bible's in your closet. You must get it now. And I'm like, what? I'm talking to myself. What the heck is going on? Now, I don't know how I knew this, but there's six closets where I lived. For some reason, I knew exactly which closet to go to. And I said to myself, well, I know the Bible's not in there. So you know what? I'm just going to get up out of my bed, go check this closet, and when I don't see the Bible, I'll just go straight back to bed. So I got on my bed. I'm walking to the closet, and I'm like, I know the Bible's not in there. I know the Bible's not in there. I open up the closet door like this, and to my amazement, I see the Bible right there, surrounded by a whole bunch of books in a plastic container on top of the shelf. I said, that's strange. So I was like, well, it's been eight years. I guess I might as well read it. <laughs> Took it down. <laughs> blew it off. It was really dusty. And I unzipped it. And I opened up the first page of the Bible. And the first words I see, it says, Any man that seek God shall find answers. And I thought, that's a coincidence. I'm not really seeking God, but I thought that was interesting. So I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to read. I mean, I'm not going to start from Genesis. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm just going to flip open the book. Wherever it lands, that's what I'll read. So I go sit down. I flip open the book. And then it landed on the book of Joshua. Immediately, I wanted to read it. Not for the reasons what you're thinking. But the only reason I wanted to read it was because a week earlier, I had seen a a story about an African warlord in Liberia. His name was General Buttnaked. <laughs> I was intrigued. Who the heck could ever be called General Buttnaked? So I had to check it out. In his story, this man killed about 20,000 people. And 
on his 32nd year of his life, he said God had came to him and told him, what you are doing is wrong. You must repent. And this man said, what is this power? What is this? And he got on his knees and asked God to forgive him of all these sins. And what was extraordinary about this, he said that God forgave him. And I'm like, God forgave you? He killed 20,000 people. To make a long story short, the guy changed his name to Joshua and started preaching and became an evangelical preacher and started preaching for God. So when I flipped open the Bible to the book of Joshua, I thought it was similar to this guy's story, <laughs> naively. So I said, oh, maybe it's similar to the African story guy. <laughs> That's how I wanted to read it. So I started reading through the book of Joshua. Now, I decided while reading, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to ask God to forgive me of every single sin that I can think of. <clears throat> so I got on my knees. And for the very first time in my life, not halfway, not 90%, but 100%, I started naming every single sin that I can think of. I said, God, forgive me for this. 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 I was there for about 45 minutes. When I couldn't think of anything else, I said, God, if there's a sin that I've committed that I'm unaware of, I want you to take it from me. From this day forward, I give you my life. I said, God, if you want to use me, you use me. But I want to go to heaven. Forgive me like you forgive Joe or Naked. I want to go to heaven. Please, God, I am yours. I am your servant. Anything you want me to do, I'm, I'll do. I want to go to heaven. Now, as soon as I said amen, something remarkable happened. I had an unquenchable desire to read the Bible. How do I know this? An hour goes by. I'm reading the Bible. Two hours go by. I'm reading the Bible. Three hours go by. I'm reading the Bible. It was the most exhilarating. It was the most exciting. It was the most vivid book I had ever read in my entire life. I was like, man, I should have read this a long time ago. <laughs> so, so I was like, man, this is fantastic. Now, after reading for hours and hours and hours, I started to get tired again because, of course, I woke up really early. Now, this is when my testimony goes from somewhat interesting to extraordinary. I went back to bed to go lie down to get some more sleep. And when I laid my head on the pillow, five minutes later, I heard another voice. The voice says, put on your clothes, get in your car and drive. You will see a man on the side of the road. When you see him, you must give him food and you must give him water. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm supposed to give a guy food and water? I don't understand this. So then I was like, okay, I guess I got to put my pants on. So I put my, my pants on. I get in my car. My wife says to me as I'm getting ready, she says, babe, where you going? I said, I don't know where I'm going. Something just told me I got to get in my car and drive. And then she says to me, you're crazy. And I'm like, babe, I know I'm crazy. But when I had this nightmare, something told me to go find my Bible. I found it. Then I gave my life to the Lord. I asked him to forgive me of my sins. And now I got to go do this. She's like, well, I don't care what you're doing, but that's crazy. You do what you got to do. <laughs> but I'm not going with you. So I get in my car. I start driving. I have no idea where I'm driving to. I make a left, I make right, I'm just driving. I said, if I'm supposed to see this guy, he better be on this road. <laughs> Eight minutes later, after me driving, I see a man on the side of the road. He's got a sign. It says, feed me. I am hungry. I will work for food. So I say, well, this must be the guy. So I pull up next to him. I said, hey, come over here. I said, look, get your stuff in the back seat. You come sit in the front seat. He gets in the car. Before I drive off, I say to him, I have never in my life wanted to do this. I have never had a desire to do this. But something told me that I got to give you food and I got to give you water. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you to Applebee's. You buy what you want. Then I'll take you to Walmart. You buy what you need. That's it. He's like, oh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Now, his name is James. So we go to Applebee's. We get out the car. We go in. 
he goes into the bathroom for like 20 minutes. His shirt is dirty. He's got a big beard. He's an old, look, 60-year-old white man with a dirty shirt, dirty jeans, and dirty pants. And he, he's washing up for like 20 minutes. I guess he's never had an opportunity to use the facilities in a while. We come back out. We order the food. As I'm waiting for the food to come, I hear another voice. The voice says, tell him that you love him. <laughs> I said, I said, I cannot tell a grown man I don't know that I love him. I said, I, can't, I can't do this. Because I'm, look, I'm looking over there. There's like people over there. And there's people over there. And they're looking at me, this young black man with this old 60-year-old dirty white man. And they're looking like, whoa, we are of no relations. <laughs> so I kind of I kind of was hesitant. But I said, man, I, I just felt like I needed to do this. So I said, look, I, I, st I used my baby voice. And I said, look. This is going to sound strange, but something just told me, and I wanted you to know, I love you, and God loves you. And the guy looks at me like I was crazy, <laughs> as if he was going to say, check please. So, so I said all stuff, and um, uh, we finished eating. We go back to my car. As soon as I get inside my car, and he gets in also, nothing told me to do this. I didn't see a sign to do this, but I just had a feeling like I needed to pray with the guy. So I said to him, look, I need to pray with you right now. Can I pray with you? And he was like, yeah. So he gives me his hand. I hold his hand, and I said, I said something simple. I said, God, bless him. Give him strength. Help him out. Bless his life. Give him prosperity. You are, you know, our truth. We love you. Amen. Now, this is the climactic point in the testimony when I knew it was Jesus Christ himself molding this entire experience, not only to change me, but to bring him, me closer to himself and to give me purpose and to fulfill what I've been searching for that I didn't even realize that I was. Now, we drove over to the parking lot of Walmart, and before I got out of the car, James, who's the homeless guy that I picked up, says to me, Shanamar, I have something to tell you. And I'm like, what is it? He goes into his pocket like so, and he puts his hand in there. And then he takes out like a trifold brochure, like a flyer. And he hands it to me. So I take it. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is good. And he's like, read it. I was like, oh, I'm looking at it. And I'm reading this thing, and it's about a woman who was an atheist that gave her life to God and found blessings. I'm like, well, that's cool, no problem, okay. And then he says to me, when he was on the street corner, he took this out of his pocket and he started to read it. And when he was finished reading it, he said for the first time of his life, with 100% of his heart, he said, God, if you are real, if you are there, I need your help today. Help me find some food, help me find some water. And five minutes after he gave that prayer and said that prayer, it was when I showed up. And I said, this is unbelievable. I said to him, this is amazing. I said, you are getting anything you want out of Walmart. Anything. You want an Xbox? You got it. I don't care. At this point, I was like, this is like, this is the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. So this is important, though, to remember. In Applebee's, I spent $42. And when we went to Walmart, the guy didn't say he needed much. He said I needed a pair of jeans, a shirt, some water, some can soap, some soap soap. I spent about $68 at Walmart. Now, as we're walking out of Walmart, I said to I said to James, I said, well, I know you don't really have a place to live, but where do you typically stay? He says to me, well, I live in an abandoned barn with a hole in the roof with another guy named Brian. And I'm like, well, where is that? He's like, oh, it's over there. I said, well, you can't possibly carry all this stuff. There's like 32 bottles of waters in here. There's canned stuff. There's no way you're going to be able to carry all the stuff back to where you live. So I said, why don't we do this? Why don't I put this stuff in my trunk? At least it would be easier for you. That way I'll just drive it back and then you can just unload it there. He's like, are you sure? I said, no problem. So we get in the car. We start driving. He directs me. Then I pull up literally to the middle of the bush, jungle, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> there's trees and bush over here. There's trees and bush in the front. 
there's trees and bush to the left, and there's like a little dirt road with like little shrubs of grass and rocks. And I'm like, yep, this is uh, definitely in the middle of the bush. I turn the car off. I go back to the trunk. I open it up. I take himself out. He takes himself out. Then we walk down into the slight decline with some rocks. And then I see the barn to my left with the hole in the roof. And then his other guy is in there. Now, as we're walking in, his friend Brian comes out the barn and says, Hey, James, who's this guy? And James says to Brian, Hey, this is Shanamar. He just helped me get some food and some water. So then Brian says to me, would you like to stay a while? Now, before my experience with the Lord, I was an avid movie bus. I could watch every single movie imaginable. NC-17, rated R, comedy, sci-fi, horror. My favorite genres was horror. And I know from watching a lot of horror movies that whenever you find yourself in the middle of the woods with two men that you don't know, and they say to you, do you want to stay a while? In that very instance is when you run and get the heck out of there. Don't even look back. <laughs> now, something remarkable happened. I cannot describe it to you. I felt as if I was bulletproof. I felt a tremendous peace. I felt a tremendous love. I felt like this is exactly where I needed to be. And I said to Brian, I said, no problem, I'll stay. He gave me like a ripped up lawn chair. There's like a little fire pit. I sit down. Then Brian, who was already there, we got there, says, would you like to hear some music? I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, music? Oh, man, it ain't that bad. Y'all got electricity. <laughs> he, he, and then he says to me, well, yeah, we have a handheld radio. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So he goes into the barn. He gets a handheld radio. And he comes back out. And he's holding it now. And he's got a little antenna here. But it's real static. It's like, shh. He's trying to find a station. So he's walking around, trying to figure out what's there. Nothing, nothing is really coming up. So he walks a little bit closer to me, gets a little bit clearer, and there's like a, 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 a tree stump that's been cut. So then he puts the radio down there. Now at this point, I'm not paying attention, but the radio is playing now because it gets a little bit clearer. And, I, and, I, and I'm talking to the men. Now, as I'm talking to them, I'm hearing the kind of music being playing on the radio. Guess what kind of music was on the radio? It was a gospel station. And I'm like, this is it. <laughs> so I'm listening to the song that's playing, and the song was all about love thy neighbor, love thy brother. And I'm like, what the heck are the chances that I'm doing something that I never would have done, and I'm believing that God is more in the whole situation, and now I'm hearing gospel music. And I said to them, have you ever heard a gospel station on the radio before? They said to me, nope, we have never heard that station on the radio before. I'm like, this is amazing. So I'm, st I'm starting getting to know the guys. One guy was a Vietnam vet. He said he had post-traumatic stress syndrome, and it kind of unraveled his life and caused him to be, be where he's at now. The other guy, James, whom I picked up, said that he was an alcoholic, and his family kind of disowned him, and they didn't want nothing to do with him, so he lost touch with him. Now, to wrap up my testimony, as I'm sitting down, James... Who, I'm, who I picked up on the side of the road says to me, Shanamar, I have a gift for you. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, I'm looking around, I'm like, there's grass, there's trees, there's rocks. I'm like, it better not be tree bark because I really don't need that. So he says to me, a week earlier, I was going to burn this for firewood, but I had a feeling like I shouldn't. And now I want you to have it. So I said to myself, okay, no problem. So he turns his back, and there's like a pile of trash on the ground. And I'm thinking, look, even if this thing is a styrofoam cup, I'm still going to accept it, no problem. He puts his hand into the trash like so, dips it down, and then he takes out the most perfect gift that I could have ever needed or wanted for myself and my family. What was the gift? Now, It was a simple, well-crafted basket. What made it so perfect? At the time, while I was with these men, my wife was pregnant. She had two cravings, ice and oranges. I would buy her a big bag of ice, and when she needed ice, I would put it in a cup and she would chew on it. And if she's really upset, she would probably throw it at me. Then I would also buy her a big bag of oranges. Now, I would buy like the 10 to 15 bag of oranges, a really huge bag. 
Now, I didn't want to put it on the ground, so the only place we had to put it was on top of our kitchen table. So, month and month of doing this repeatedly, I would just slice the bag open, peel the orange, and give it to my wife. Now, after doing this for so long, what would always happen is the oranges would fall out the bag, roll off the table, roll down the steps. And I would get so annoyed at this because I'd have to pick up the orange, wash it up because I didn't want any bacteria or nothing to affect her. And then, you know, either throw it away or do something. Exactly seven days prior to me being in this location, as this location with these men, I said these exact words to my wife. I said, baby, baby, I am so tired of this crap. I said, I wish, I wish I had a basket to put these stupid oranges in. I'm so tired. Every time they're in the basket, the, 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 the bag, they always roll over and pull around. Now, in the most unlikely place, in the most unlikely series of events, I was able to get a gift not only that I needed, but that I wanted from a complete stranger whom I would have never had any interaction with. Because my belief when it comes to homeless men was that they caused themselves to be in that situation. I'm not you. Look where I am. I have a good life. I have this. I have that. Look, I took care of mine, so you got to be able to take care of yours. I accepted the gift. And before I left, I said, thank you. And we all held hands and we prayed together. Now, exactly two weeks after this experience, remember I said to you that I spent $42 at Applebee's and $68 at Walmart? Exactly two weeks, I received a check in the mail for $150. Not only covering what I spent, but giving me a little bit no more. This is how God works. When you give yourself to him and you surrender and you use money that you weren't planning on using that you don't really have because I charged it to my credit card, he repays you. But how did he repay me? Not just with money. He completely changed my life and gave me purpose. What do I mean? I told you who I was before, the Lord. And now, who I was now was a completely different person. I finally understood what it says to be a new creation. I couldn't watch any movie that was vulgar, violent, sexual. I couldn't watch any movie that was explicit, that was nasty. All I wanted to do was read the Bible and pray all the time. I just wanted to soak up everything about God. So, I share this testimony because it says in Luke, whoever shares his testimony. I give you a testimony so you can glorify me. This has nothing to do with me, but this has everything to do with Jesus Christ. All the years when I thought I was for him, I loved the world more than I loved Jesus Christ. I never told anybody about Jesus Christ. I never read the Bible. I never had a person which, which I really prayed, not just for asking for things that I wanted, but to thank him, to praise him. Now, when you look back on the testimony, there's a key important parts. I had to call out to God with everything from my heart, my mind, and my soul. Not half-heartedly. And when I did this, even in the middle of the dream, he answered me immediately. What does that mean? God is always there. And the moment we really scream out to him with everything that we have, he will come to us and give us purpose and change our lives. Secondly. I needed to have faith to get up out of my bed. There's a scripture that says in Revelation 3.20 that I knock on the door <coughs> waiting to come in so I may eat with you and sup with you. Now, a lot of times when people hear that knock, you know what they say to themselves? Oh, that's just a telemarketer. I'm not getting up out of my bed. They can't even imagine that that's Jesus Christ. So their faith doesn't allow them to walk up and open the door and invite him into their hearts. And I thank God every day that I had just enough faith to go check that closet. Thirdly, in my life before this experience, I would pray to God. I would ask him to forgive me. Now, but I never did it 100%. I would only ask him for the stuff that I thought was really, really, really bad. Sorry for me doing that thing. I know that was really wicked. But that other thing, you know, cheating on my taxes, telling a few white lies, you know, not, not completely, you know, having... You know, having anger, all that stuff. Everybody does that. I, look, I'm, everybody does that. I ain't gonna need to ask you for that. Everybody gets angry. Everybody does this. But I was completely wrong. 
I finally understood what sin was. It's not something bad that you do. Sin is what puts up a barrier between you and God. So when he speaks, when he's trying to give you comfort, when he's trying to give you purpose, that barrier blocks it. So you can't fulfill your destiny, your purpose that Christ has in store for you. So when I ask God to forgive me of all my sins, even the ones that I couldn't even think of, that barrier was removed and everything that God had in store for me, I was not, it was not open to me. And I can clearly hear his will, hear his voice and get an instruction from the Holy Spirit. Now, I was baptized with water, but I was just baptized with the water. When I did this, I was not baptized by the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the one that guides us, is the comforter, is the teacher, and he guides us into all truth and to do the will of the Father. What was the will of the Father? He answered the prayer of this man on the street corner that called out to God with all of his heart, needing him because he was at the bottom, hopeless without hope. And because I surrendered myself, I removed that sin, God was able to use me to answer the prayer of this man. Now, there's five, there's about six ways that God speaks to people. Now, you got to ask yourself this question. Has God spoken to me? And did I open up the door? Number one, God can talk to you in a dream. Because guess what? <laughs> in the middle of my dream, he said to me, read your Bible. Secondly, God can talk to you through the Bible. Meaning you can open up a verse, a passage, a chapter that gives you exactly what you need to know, when you need to know it, and either gives you impact, warmth, or love, and comforts you and gives you guidance. Third way, God can come to you through somebody that has the Holy Spirit. I have surrendered myself to God and I have received the Holy Spirit. And I'm coming to you to share my testimony with you. Has anybody else ever came to you and said you need to forgive? Has anyone ever came to you and said to you, you need to build your relationship with Christ? Has anyone ever said to you that you can't be for Christ if you're still loving the world? Always pay attention to that because God is talking. Number four, you can hear the audible voice of God. Forget what any preacher tells you. Forget what anybody else tells you. God is real enough to speak. Now, when he speaks, it's not like you hear a sound and you turn your head. Oh, it's over there. Or, oh, he's over there. No, it comes from then. Everything else is muffled and you can only hear the voice of God. It's loud. It is clear. But you need to have the sin to remove it. It's like the McDonald's speaker when you're saying, oh, okay. It's real muffled. But when you remove that, it becomes crystal clear. My son, in whom I'm well pleased, I am here to love you. That's the kind of stuff that he will say to you. Third way, God can, um, um, a fifth way, God can speak to you to situation and circumstances. You ever been in a situation where you see something and something prompts you to think of an idea that leads you back to Christ? You see someone, you know, showing love to another person, even though they just got beat up, and you say, man, what kind of love is that? How do I get that love? Or do you ever see something where someone does something for you and it just makes you feel really happy and you want to do the same thing for that person and you realize that person was a Christian? Like, oh, how did that happen? This is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. For that homeless guy, it's to have somebody come to him, a random stranger, and help him get him food and water. And the final way God talks to us is... You can just see a sign, words on a paper, a billboard, something that gives you what you need to know, how you need to know it. You can see something on the back of a car, a license plate that says, Jesus loves you. Or, you know, change can only happen when you surrender to Christ. Or the life of a baby should be kept at all costs because it is precious to God. Whatever it is, God can talk you through that. So, because of this experience, I used to make between eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year. Everything that I wanted, that I needed, I had, and I had no issues. I thought my life was fantastic. I thought I was going to go to heaven, but it was completely wrong. I was empty, but I didn't know it. I was far from God, but I didn't know it, and I was going straight to hell, and I didn't know it. But God brought me back to Him. One, because I called out for His help with all my heart, and I knew He needed it, and two. 
He loved me enough to forgive me of all my sins. And three, he loved me enough to forgive me. So I tell you this. Do you love God enough to get on your knees right now and ask him, God, can you change me instantaneously? Can you heal my heart? Can you give me purpose? Because I guarantee you he will. So this is my testimony. If you have a testimony, you better share it with every single person that you know. Share it with your friends, share it with your sister, share it with your brother. Because if a train was coming and your friend or your mother or your brother or your, your cousin was standing on the train tracks and they didn't realize the train was coming, you would be screaming out right now, get off the train tracks. You're going to get killed. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. I was on that train track. And God helped me get off. Now, you could be, through your surrendering to God, a vessel that God uses to help somebody get off the train tracks. Now, if you don't care about people getting hit, or if you don't care about people going to hell, well, hey, let your friend stay on the train track, and when the train comes, they're going to get hit. But guess what? It is your responsibility, if you have changed, to represent change. It is your responsibility, if you love God, to tell other people about how much God has changed and what his love is. So, I say this with everything in my heart. God is my savior. He is my truth. He is everything that I desire. He is everything that I need. I love him more than I love my wife and my son. And by doing that, I love my wife and my son more. He has given me purpose. He has given me strength. I make 90% less than what I used to before my experience with the Lord. But now I am more content, more fulfilled, more happy. Does that mean trials don't happen? Absolutely not. They still do. But now I understand that every single circumstance that happens, every single instance when the devil is trying to take away my faith, God helps me to overcome it. And then he uses that to strengthen my testimony. He doesn't cause it to happen. He allows it to happen because he knows I will be able to overcome anything once I have Christ in my heart and my mind in my soul. So, if you haven't already done so, say this prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, I humbly come before you to ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Forgive me of all the sins that I've committed and even the sins that I'm unaware of. I give my life to you from this day forward. I want you to use me. I want to serve you. I want you to bring fulfillment and passion and peace and strength into my life. I give you all that I am, today, tomorrow, for the rest of my life. Keep my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Help me, Lord. Help me to do your will. Help me to overcome the sins that I can't handle. I choose you. You are my strength. You are my truth. You are holy. You are righteous. I shall walk in the light that you have provided, and I renounce the darkness. I say these things in your mighty name, Jesus Christ, because I love you and I desire to seek you with all of my heart. Amen, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, you are instantaneously saved, but you are not instantaneously mature. So what do you have to do? You have to strengthen up your muscles. It is equivalent to being a baby, a newborn, because God said you have to be born again, and if you're born again, you have a new life. You become a baby. Without sin, pure, but your muscles aren't strong, so you can't really walk. Your immune system is low, so you need to eat food. And then you still got to wear clothes so that you can be protected from the weather. All these things are representative or equivalent to you got to pray to God to build up your, your spiritual eyes. You got you to gotta read your Bible to build up the truth and give you strength and clarity. You have to surrender to him. You have to ask him for guidance. And you got to have the shield of armor, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the loins of truth, and a helmet of salvation put on you so you can protect yourself from the elements, the weather. So just grow. I shall be here with you because I'm your brother. And Christ will always be here with you. Just as he changed me, he can change you. Just as he speaks to me, he can speak to you. Thank you. May God's blessing always be upon you your family, your friends, and anyone who does not know the love and joy and truth that it is to have Jesus Christ as your Savior, their Master, their Lord, and their God. Amen.